So now in this final video on reproduction too, and our final look at the female reproductive system, we're going to conclude on an idea that is actually specific to humans, and human females more specifically I should say, called menopause. What I left you on in the previous video was the fact that females will undergo about 500 of those cycles of menstrual cycles, which include ovarian and uterine cycles, uh, in their lifetime. And that equates to about 38 years. And if we assume that a female becomes sexually mature at about the age of 13, which is a decent average age for sexual maturity, meaning that's the first time you have a menstrual cycle, that's the first time you're capable of pregnancy, this would mean that the female would end up being about 51 years old at the end of those 38 years. So now you might be wondering, what happens post-51? What happens after those years? Usually what happens during that time is something known as menopause. And menopause can be broadly defined as the following. Menopause is the cessation. Cessation just means the stopping or the end, the completion or no longer happening basically of ovulation. And with ovulation also, that would mean the cessation of menstruation as a whole, the cycle of menstruation, uh, usually between the ages, and it varies between individuals, uh, about 46 and 54. And 51 is almost right in the middle of that uh, age range that we have just established. So between the ages of 46 and 54, most women have this cessation of ovulation and menstruation called menopause. Now, question. What we've been saying most of biology is that life is all about survival and reproduction. Why would, at least you know, evolutionarily speaking, why would you stop the potential for reproduction in half of the species of humans? Why is that even necessary? So let's ask ourselves that. It's a very important question and it really tells us the unique nature of us as humans, I think. So why would this happen if we've been constantly saying that reproduction is king and surviving is king in all of biology? Well, this is going to sort of happen in terms of physiology. Physiologically, this is going to happen because the ovaries themselves, the ovaries which are the prominent primary, primary uh, gonadal structures in females, they will actually lose over time their responsiveness to the hormones that talk to the ovaries, to the hormones that come from the anterior pituitary, which are both FSH plus LH. So ovaries lose responsiveness to FSH and LH. What does this cause downstream? This will then cause a very steep decline, a huge decline in overall estradiol production. And if you look at the points at which estradiol was necessary, at the points at which estradiol should be being produced, all we have seen is that estradiol is a big part of the preparation and maintenance of a pregnancy. FSH and LH are the precursors to that estradiol production and release. So what we notice and remember is that estradiol levels, if they're low, remember when we said that there's very low levels of estradiol, they're going to inhibit FSH and LH in that very first look at the ovarian cycle? Same idea here. This is going to directly sort of encompass and sort of uh, also sort of culminate in the decrease of FSH and LH because there's such low levels of estradiol to begin with. Because there's such low responsiveness to FSH and LH, you're going to have this cumulative effect that's very simple. Not a lot of hormones, not a lot of response to hormones, not any ovulation or menstruation because these are directly tied to hormonal response and regulation. So, now, this might have satisfied the physiological reasoning as to why ovulation and menstruation stop in women, but let's look at the broader reasoning. I think the broader purpose of this um, serves as a very interesting point of discussion, because evolutionarily, once again, we still haven't answered the question. We haven't said why it makes sense to stop reproducing, because fitness is all about successful reproduction, and fitness is what governs natural selection. So, if we even look at other animals, the majority, a huge majority of other animals, almost all other animals, don't go through menopause. So again, this makes us as humans unique. But why us? Why is this a good thing if all these other animals aren't doing it, they're foregoing it? Well, now let's look at the real evolutionary reason. 
Evolutionarily, and this is simplifying it in a great deal, but it's still worth stating, evolutionarily, um, evolutionarily, I should say, there we go, evolutionarily, uh, there is an advantage, there is an advantage to have children initially, to initially have children and then stop reproducing, then stop reproducing. Okay, still doesn't answer the question. Why? Why is that? Well, that's because if you have children and you successfully have them, you've successfully reproduced before this age and onset of menopause, this then gives you the opportunity upon this age and onset of menopause to provide more, more than any other species, more energy to your offspring. Because guess what? You will no longer provide resources or energy to the process of pregnancy and reproduction. That is a huge energetic investment that a female takes and that energy that's invested in that process is taken away from, let's say, the offspring that are already born and are already living. But now what you can do is you can sort of take those resources that you would have put into a possible pregnancy and sort of disperse them to the current and living offspring that are there, that are already there. So what's going to happen is eventually, and broadly speaking, you will provide more care. So you provide more care to your current offspring because you're no longer reproducing, so you're only caring about your current offspring. You don't have to worry about anything in the future. And in addition, you may also, around this age, and probably after this age, you know, a couple of years after this age, you then can also provide care to grandchildren. Why are our grandparents such good friends of ours? Why are they such good comrades of humans? Why do we have such intimate relationships with our grandparents? Well, evolutionarily speaking, it seems that it just makes sense that our grandchildren, our grandparents who are of the age in which they cannot no longer, they can no longer reproduce, not only invest their resources in caring for their own, you know, children, but they can care for us as grandchildren at a greater deal because they don't have to possibly reproduce anymore. So it's a very interesting thing, I think, to think of this as a sort of human, uh, human specific event that happens. And that concludes our look at female reproduction. I know it's a lot to take in. Remember, figure 46.14, take that to memory. Always remember that figure. It's a great, great figure to really understand the whole process of menstruation, which is very difficult to understand. But overall, I hope you've gained a greater appreciation for the female reproductive system.